Thank you for your generosity. And uh, that's, by the way, the topic we're going to hit today as we turn now to the Sermon on the Mount. We've been in this series for a while. In chapter 6, you'll notice that we're going to skip verses 1 through 18. And let me explain why. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18, as Jesus gets to the application of the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, these are how the citizens of the kingdom are to live. He starts with prayer. And that famous Lord's Prayer is in this, this portion of Scripture. But here's the deal. We just preached on it last March. And this past January, we've talked about fasting and prayer. So we've already preached through this. And we thought, well, we don't want to be redundant and do it again. So that's why we're going to jump right down to verse 19 now. And today we're going to finish chapter six. So we're looking at verses 19 through 34. Um, Matthew chapter six, verses 19 to 34. And this is a hard hitting topic. I don't expect a lot of, amen, brother, I preach it. <laughs> because Jesus is getting to the heart. And the heart is connected to the wallet. And that's what he talks about here. Now there's warnings all throughout scripture about loving money. For example, in first Timothy uh, chapter six, and by the way, in our culture, it doesn't matter if you have a lot of money or a little, that has nothing to do with the love of money. The love of money is this unhealthy desire to accumulate stuff for yourself. This desire, this eagerness to get rich. Is there anything wrong with being rich? Not necessarily. Is there anything wrong with being poor? No. The the problem is the heart. Whether you're rich or poor, whether you have little or much, the problem is the heart. And so that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is getting to the heart as he's talking to the multitudes. Now, what we're going to see here um, is changes that we may need to make to our thinking in order to keep us from loving money. And I'm going to start in Timothy, and then we're going to jump into the Sermon on the Mount. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11. This was uh, Paul talking to his um, son in the faith, Timothy, who's the pastor of the church at Ephesus. He says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And here it is, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. I wonder if when Paul was writing these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, his mind was going back to the Sermon on the Mount. Because we see in Jesus' teaching here today how that we need to adjust our thinking to keep us from the trap of loving money. Again, nothing wrong with having money, nothing wrong with saving money, nothing wrong with earning money. Actually, the Bible is for that. You know, be wise, have enough money where if you can, you can leave an inheritance to your children's children. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. The issue is not us having money. The issue is money having us. And that is an internal thing that we are tempted with. Many of us are tempted with. And this was the thing that I struggled with as a young person. Because I grew up in kind of an affluent home and was able to travel and have a, when I was 15, my stepdad gave me a, Camaro with T-tops and a gas card. And I just enjoyed that, you know? This is cool. My sister got one even nicer than me. Got a motorcycle, you know, I had a snowmobile, I had all the stuff. And so I kind of got used to that. And so as I'm growing up, I'm like, you know, I'd like to continue that kind of lifestyle. And so when I went to college, I went to become a financial analyst. Because I figured, well, finance people must know something about money. They got money. Again, the problem is not in having money or earning money or saving money. Those are good things. The problem is the heart. And my heart was covetous. I wanted to make money more than I wanted almost anything else except Lisa. That's what I wanted the most. Lisa, then money. Lisa, money. And I thought money wouldn't be too bad to have to help Lisa. Uh, But really, that's kind of where my affection was. Now I'm a Christian. 
I love God. And so God let me do it. I graduated from University of Maine, actually at Orono. BS in business administration with a concentration of finance. Got a job as a financial analyst. And I'm doing this for a couple of years and I'm completely miserable. And I thought about money all the time. I mean, I just thought about, you know, I, from the time I was a teenager, I kept a picture of my dream house in my briefcase. I had a briefcase. Talk about a nerd. It was kind of a joke because I liked this briefcase and I would clip it onto the back of my motorcycle. I'd strap it on with bungee cords just so I wouldn't lose my briefcase. But I could pop that thing. Now everyone has phones, you know, but then it was briefcases. It was cool. I had a locking briefcase and I'd pop that open and I could pull into one of the, the sleeves, you know, one of the pockets, a picture of the house I'm going to have someday. And I remember saying, you know, I'm going to have a brand new Porsche and I'm going to put on the license plate. This was just my token spiritual thing. I was going to put on the license plate, read the book. I don't know if that would even fit, but you know, I thought about money. That was my goal. Until God let me pursue that and wasn't making a whole lot of money, a little, but I was miserable. And I remember seeking God and, and the Lord dealing with my heart in particular about being covetous, about wanting that, that success, that lifestyle stuff, really more, if I'm honest, than I wanted to pursue God and what God had for me. And so my story is the next 10 years, God beat that out of me, I hope, by making me poor. <laughs> when I say poor, I, I don't mean like we didn't have enough. We had just enough. There's a land of lack where you don't have enough to pay your bills. There's a land of plenty where you have more than enough. And there's a land of even where you're paycheck to paycheck. You got food and clothes. So the Bible says you can be content, but you ain't got nothing else. And it's a good thing you got love because you ain't got money, right? So I lived there for a good decade or more. But what I began to understand was my heart has to be first and foremost for the kingdom of God, not for stuff. Well, as Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, that is his approach. He's talking to all different folks in, in different socioeconomic statuses from the blue collar fisherman to the wealthy tax collector and he's teaching them about the kingdom of God and how the secrets of the kingdom of God, how this works, how citizens that of the kingdom of heaven while on earth live and what their values are, what their attitudes are, and how they handle money is a big part of that. And so I'm not taking a special offering so you can relax. I'm not coming after your wallets, you know. No, seriously, this is about your heart. This is about your relationship with God. And your money has an impact here. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. So four changes, perhaps, that we need to make in our mind to keep us free from the love of money. And the first is how we use money. And here's the point. Don't store up a bunch of money for the purpose of self-indulgence. That's the point. Verse uh, nine, Chapter 6, verse 19, we'll start. Do not store up for yourselves. He didn't say you can't store up. What did he say? Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. If you do, moths and vermin destroy it and thieves may break in and steal it, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And verse 21 is so telling. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your affection follows your money. Isn't that true? If you like golf, you have a nice set of golf clubs and you, you play golf quite a bit. If you like cars, you have a nice car. You invest. If you like clothes, if you like makeup, if you like health and fitness, if you like travel, if you like homes, what, whatever you enjoy, you invest in. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. It's not hard to tell what you love. Just look at your checkbook. What do you spend your money on? What do you spend your time doing? Because your money and your time show where your heart is, where your passion is, where, what you invest in. And again, there's nothing wrong with having things. Cliche, nonetheless true, it's things having you. And the Lord is saying here, listen, don't be a person 
who invests all your money in yourself and not in the kingdom of God. That's a problem. That's called covetousness. That's greedy. How do you use your money? Again, the issue is not whether you have much or little. The issue is your heart. And Jesus is saying, you've got to store up treasures in heaven. So he's not forbidding us from earning money, from keeping money. He's forbidding us from storing money to be wasted on self-indulgence. He doesn't say, lay not up treasures on earth. He says this, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Jesus told a story, a parable in Luke, about a man who earned a lot of money. And he said, here's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to build bigger barns so I can store all my stuff. And he, he made it his goal, his mission in life to build bigger barns so he could store more of his stuff. And Jesus said, you fool. Tonight, your life is going to be required of you. And then how much the stuff you have accumulated is going to be given to somebody else. It's that old saying when, when the Rockefeller died with his billions, how much money did he leave behind? All of it. We leave it all. You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer on the way to heaven. You leave it all. All those things you worked for, all you toiled for, somebody else is going to enjoy it. So don't use your life, wear yourself out running after stuff and money. Again, nothing wrong with having it, but don't store it all up for yourself. That's the point. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. John Wesley, who is the founder of the United Methodist Movement, said this. He said, I have three great principles when it comes to money. Principle number one, earn as much as you can. Principle number two, save as much as you can. And principle number three, in order that you may give to God as much as you can. Does that sound like you? So you can give to God as much as you can, or is it so you can give to yourself as much as you can. The issue here is the accumulation of wealth for self indulgence, for excessive luxury, and a hard heartedness towards the cause of God because we're spending it all on ourselves. You lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Jesus said they're going to remain here. But you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, and they'll be there to greet you when you arrive. What we keep in this life, we eventually lose. But what we give to God, we keep forever. That's the principle. So where's your treasury? Where's your heart? Again, nothing wrong having it in golf clubs or clothes or travel or homes or cars. As long as your first priority is the kingdom. The kingdom. Second thing is to keep us from the love of money is not only how we use money, but how do we see money? What is our vision? Do we have a healthy vision for where our money is going? He goes on to say in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, what's he talking about? Eyes that are unhealthy are eyes that are focused on things that they should not be focused on. Here in particular, money. Your whole body is going to be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What's he saying here? Keep a healthy vision regarding money focused on the kingdom of heaven. An earthly vision that is selfish and indulgent plunges us into spiritual darkness. In Luke 16, Jesus is talking about this principle. He says it this way. If you're not faithful in handling 
one translation says filthy mammon. If you're not faithful in handling unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? You know why we look at people like in Hollywood or sports oftentimes and part of us is like, oh, wouldn't I love to have that lifestyle and that money? And you know, that's kind of what I was chasing at one point in my life. But then you look at their lives later and they're divorced, they're addicted, they're miserable. Old saying, money can't buy happiness. They had their eyes on the wrong thing. They got their eyes on what they thought would bring them happiness and success. And there's a measure of it in it, but it's not enduring, it's fleeting. And Jesus is saying, listen, if you want true light in your life, then look at the right things, the best things. Third thing, here's where the rubber meets the road. How do you keep yourself from the love of money? May need to change how you use money, how you see it, and ultimately how you spend it, how you prioritize it. And he goes on to say in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And here's the statement that hits home. You cannot serve both God and money. Really, there's two gods in the world. There's the God who made everything and there's the God of money. And it all comes back to that. Are you serving the God who created the universe or are you serving the God of self money? Again, we're going to be free from the love of money when we want to make sure we don't use our money for self-indulgence. That's using it correctly. Secondly, we want to make sure our focus is on the, the Lord, the kingdom, so we can see spiritually clear. Thirdly, we need to prioritize how we spend our money. I want to talk to you about a principle that we see in scripture. And then I'll address perhaps a, a challenging theological nuance in the new Testament regarding it. But it's a, it's a subject of tithing. The word tithe literally means a 10th. And so if you tithe to God first, then it means you give a 10th of your income. So if you make a thousand bucks a week, the first hundred you give to God. Now, tithing was seen way back in the book of Genesis before the law ever existed. For example, Abraham, father of the faith, gave a tithe, a 10th to Melchizedek, the priest of God. So we see this principle of being generous with the things of God before the law. And then there was, of course, the nation of Israel whom came through the loins of Abraham, right? And Israel, the nation, God gave them his laws, his ceremonial laws, his civil laws. And within those laws, there was the tithe. The tithe was like a forced tax. You got to pay 10% to God and so you bring it, and this keeps the temple going, and this keeps the priests and the Levites in business. This is how they take care of their family. So bring the tithe. And again, this is what uh, Malachi the prophet told the people of Israel when they, they were not being blessed as a people. He said, listen, you're robbing God. How are we robbing God? In tithes and offerings. Therefore, you know, you're putting money into bags with holes in it because you're, you're not honoring God with the first, with the 10th. And then we come over to the New Testament. We see like in Matthew 23, 23, for example, where Jesus is talking about giving to God the tithe, the 10th. He said, you should do these other things. These are things more important than the tithe, mercy and justice. And, but you should do the former without neglecting the latter. And so he says, Tithing, yeah, it's a good thing. The principle is generosity. The principle is give to God so you're not being self-indulgent and that you're putting God first. And with the tithe, for example, we see in Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, the scripture says this, honor the Lord with your wealth. Are you doing that? Yeah, I don't make anything. Nothing? Make 10 bucks a week. Give one to God, right? The first one to God. 
honor the Lord with your wealth. It's like the little kid who had 10 little dimes. His mother was teaching him how to tithe. And he had these 10 little shiny dimes and he's so excited. Mom, I, I got 10, I got a buck. I got 10 dimes. That's wonderful. And while he's walking, one of the dimes fell out of, the, out of his hand and started rolling towards a sewer gutter and fell in. Plop. And he goes, oh no, mom, there goes God's. <laughs> Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim brim over with new wine. God's saying, listen, if you honor me, and that's the principle, it's generously honoring God with your wealth. And again, do you do that? Do you do that? Well, I I can't afford to do that. We had a, a gentleman I was working with years ago that was struggling in his marriage and finances were one of the biggest issues in their marriage. And so I was trying to help him kind of just do a a real practical budget. And I looked over his income and I looked at his truck payment. His truck payment was almost 50% of his income. And I'm like, dude, talk about self-indulgence. No wonder you don't have any money. You got a nice truck. I hope you like it. (laughs) Now we've got to use some wisdom here too, but The first bit of wisdom is give to God first. Give him your first. That's Lisa and I have done this every, we'll be married 35 years, May 20th. We've done it every single week that we've gotten paid for 35 years with the exception of one month when I was in Bible school, when I heard a teaching, oh, you don't need to tithe. And I said, yeah, I'm in Bible school anyway. In my mind, I justified it. We don't make much money. I was pretty broke going to Bible school. I can't afford it. So I'm not going to do it. And we didn't for one month. And Lisa was like, no, you have to obey God. I'm like, talk to the hand because I ain't doing it. And I'll never forget what happened. Um, so we're a couple college kids, little baby, working at a front desk for just a little over minimum wage, really just barely make. I remember one week, our whole family had $40 for groceries. And there was $40, 40.00 in the checkbook. We went and bought groceries and it came to 40.00. We ate a lot of spaghetti and canned tomato sauce in those days and peanut butter. And, you know, you did what you had to do. And someone had sent us um, a care package. And, you know, when you're young and young family and you don't have much money, you just, those care packages are everything. And I remember it came in this nice little box. We unwrapped it and, in it, there were these clothes and there was some food tucked in it. And there's this nice little envelope and open the envelope up and it was a, a card. And so we called the person, Hey, thank you so much for thinking of us. The food is awesome. The clothes are awesome. Thank you for the card. There's like silence on the other end of the line. And they're like, what about the cash? And we're like, what cash? They, they were sick. He said, I put, they put hundreds and hundreds of dollars and twenties in there, put it in an envelope, stuffed it in the envelope, sealed it, put clothes around it, put it in a package, wrapped it up. And so, somehow someone post office unwrapped it, undid the package, got, stole the cash, put a card in a new envelope, sealed it all back up and it was gone. I don't know how you'd react to that, but you know what I immediately did? I remembered Malachi that when you're robbing God, that, that the locust is going to eat your crops. And I'm like, well, that was my crop. It done got eaten. So I repented. I changed. I said right there, listen, I, you can talk to Lisa. We've done this. I don't care if we don't have enough money to pay the rest of the bills. I'll call and make a payment arrangement. We're given to God first. And we've lived by that principle ever since. And praise God, we haven't always had a lot, but we've always had enough. And God has taken care of us. The bigger issue is the heart. Where your treasure is, there's your heart. You can't love God and money. So do you prioritize God? Or is he just a side note? You like tip him like you'd tip someone at the fast food restaurant. It's up to you. But as for me in my house, we're going to, we're going to tithe. We're going to give to God. Final thing. And here, 
this is, this next portion of scripture is, this is my top 10 in all the Bible in terms of how many times I've gone to it. And here's the thing, change how we trust in money, transfer that trust to God. And now he begins, begins to talk about worrying because a lot of times the reason people hoard or spend it on themselves, sometimes it's greedy, materialistic. Sometimes it's just fear. I don't think I can afford to do that. I don't, I can't afford to give to God. And they're worried. And Jesus said this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. And look at the birds. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. They're not socking it up. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? In God's eyes, we're made in his image. We're more valuable than the birds. And if he's going to take care of them, Jesus is saying he's going to take care of you. Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Worrying is kind of like rocking in a rocking chair. Keeps you busy, but you don't go anywhere. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. That's how God clothes grass. The field, which is here today and thrown tomorrow on the fire. How, how will he not much more clothe you? Here's the issue. Well, you have little faith. So don't worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? How shall I buy a house? How am I going to pay off my school? What for the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows you need them. Pagans run. Pagans run after stuff. Pagans run after things. Pagans run after goals that ultimately are meant to be spent on self-indulgence and they're not rich towards the kingdom. Pagans run, believers rest. Doesn't mean we don't invest. It doesn't mean we don't work hard and that we don't save, but on the inside, there is a rest. Why? Because our priorities are in order and we are trusting God. And here's the, here's the top 10 verse. You ready? Seek first his kingdom And his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Did you catch that? Seek first the kingdom, not your own kingdom. Seek first God's right way of doing things, which is to honor him first with your wealth. Seek first God in his kingdom. And what will he do? He'll help you with everything else. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What's Jesus saying? Our confidence is built on God. Verse 25, don't worry about your life. Are you worried about your life? Verse 31, don't worry about food, drink, and clothes. Don't worry about your stuff. Are you worried about your stuff? Verse 34, don't worry about tomorrow. Are you worried about your future? Since our heavenly treasure fully satisfies and sets the heart in the right place. And since generous giving to God brings mental, moral, spiritual vision. And since allegiance to the Lord puts us under his loving authority and care. Therefore, we can have confidence and not worry about our physical life. The basic necessities of life are even under God's control. That's living by faith. I want to close with a story. Uh, It's from World War II. As World War II was coming to a close, the Allied armies gathered many of the hungry orphans. And that's how we started talking about Operation Christmas Child. These orphans were left as a result of the war and their parents being killed or displaced. And so these children were placed in camps where they were well fed. 
And despite the excellent care the allies were providing, they found that the children still could not sleep. They seemed nervous and afraid, and they would stay awake all night with insomnia, staring at the ceiling. And finally, somebody came in to try to figure out what was going on. And after observing, they came up with a solution. That every night before the children were put in bed, they were given a little piece of bread to hold in their hand. And they went to sleep clutching this little piece of bread. I say, what was the point of that? The point was they had lived so long existing without food and, and in hunger that they couldn't sleep for fear that they wouldn't be able to eat the next day. But once they had a little piece of bread in their hand, they knew that that next day was secure. And then they could rest and go to sleep. It's as if when God gives us the promise Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. His words are like a little piece of bread in our hands. And the Lord's saying, you can go to sleep without worrying because you can trust in me. What are you worried about? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you as well. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're all at different places in our life, different stages, ages. But one thing is true for all of us. And that is you are the creator of all things and you desire for each one of us, wherever we are in life, to put our faith in you. To not waste time worrying to not indulge ourself, but to rather be focused firstly on your kingdom. That our hearts would be fully committed to you. That our treasure would be invested in your kingdom first and foremost. Help us, Lord, with those issues of doubt. Help us with those idols that we may have in our life. Help us through the fears. Help us, Lord, to do what you've taught us, Jesus, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else will be added unto us as well. Put our trust in you, Jesus. Amen.